Thank you, everyone, for being here. My name is Alberto Garcia. I work for Igalia. I've been working in the block layer of QMU for the past few years. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about the QCO2 format and the work that I've, we've been doing to try to make it faster. So first, I will start to, by giving a, a brief introduce, intro, overview of the QCO2 format. QCO2 format, as you know, is the native file format used by QMU for storing disk images. It has multiple features, can grow on demand, supports backing files, snapshots, encryption, compression, and under certain circumstances, it can achieve good performance, comparable to that of raw files. However, that's not always the case. So in this talk, I will try to uh, describe the problems that the uh, QCO2 format has and some ways to improve this performance. There's three different approaches. One of, one of them requires simply configuration changes. Another approach requires changes to the QCO2 driver itself. And the third approach would, uh, needs changes in the on-disk format of uh, QCO2. So let's start by giving a very brief overview of how a QCO2 file looks like. A QCO2 file is divided into clusters of the same size. The cluster size can be configured when you create the image. It's 64K by default. And each cluster has a different type. There's different, uh, these are not all the uh, possible cluster types, but are some of the most common ones. Uh, the data clusters are the clusters that contain the, the data that the guest can see. So in order to map the that data as the guest sees it into the data in the QCO2 file, we need some uh, data structures. Those are the L1 and L2 tables. So with the L1 and L2 tables, we can convert a guest address uh, into a host address into the QCO2 file. So um, these L1 and L2 tables are simply a two-level data structure with pointers to the data clusters. There's nothing particularly complicated about that. Uh, in this example, the entries that are in white means that haven't been initialized. So that means that the cluster for that data haven't been allocated there. Uh, so if the guest tries to read data from them, it will get zeros. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the QCO2 format also supports backing files. That means that when the guest tries to read data from a, from a part of the disk, if uh, that data hasn't been allocated in a particular QCO2 file, then it will go to the backing file and try to see if the data is there. Uh, backing files can be changed, so each backing file can have one, one backing uh, file and so on and so forth. And it's also important to note that backing files don't need to have the same format or cluster size as the, as the original image. So once that we have seen this, the basic data structure that maps guests into host clusters, we're going to see what are the problems that are the result of that. Uh, first of all, when you need to uh, access the uh, QCO2 image from, from the guest, you need to, before uh, going to the data cluster, you need to f first figure out where it is. So that means reading the L1 table, going to the uh, appropriate L2 table and reading it, and then going to the actual data uh, cluster. As you can see, that uh, requires extra I.O., and that has a big impact in performance. The solution, of course, is to keep this uh, metadata in memory. For the case of the L1 table, that's not a problem because the L1 table is small and it can be kept in RAM all the time. L2 tables, however, are a different thing because they are allocated on demand as the image grows. And if the image is uh, large, uh, they, can either, they can take a, lo a lot of the disk space. So we can keep everything in memory. Uh, QMO has a QCO2 cache for the L2 tables. And that can be used to speed up disk access. The maximum amount of um, uh, metadata can be very large depending on the image, so we cannot keep everything in memory. Here's there's a table that shows uh, what's the metadata that is necessary for a particular image. The size of the metadata depends on the cluster size and on the image size. So for one terabyte disk image, uh, we can see how much L2 metadata we need uh, for uh, each type of uh, cluster size. So how to use the QCO2 cache? The QCO2 cache is enabled by default and has a size of one megabyte. It can be changed with the L2 cache size option. And with the default, default cluster of uh, 64 kilobytes, that's enough for an eight gigabyte uh, disk image. So if your image is eight gigabyte or less, and you're, you're using the default cluster, then you don't need to worry about it. 
However, if you're using a different image, then you might need to take a look at that because the performance, uh, the effects on performance can be dramatic. This table, uh, I made it with a 20 gigabyte uh, image fully populated. And the last row with the 2.5 megabytes of cache, that's the maximum amount of cache that you need for this kind of, for this uh, image size. So that's the performance that you see there. It's around 64,000 IOPS. That's what you get more or less with raw files. So in this case, the QCO2 is comparable to a raw file. However, if the cache size is smaller, as you can see, the, the performance is a fraction of that. So you really need to uh, increase the cache size if you want to get good performance here. Now the problem is, how do we know how much cache do, uh, we need? There's a formula for that, it's the one that you see here. And the problem is that the formula is too complicated. It's not obvious and the user shouldn't really need to know about it. So maybe QM should have a better default, but the problem is, what's a good default? That's still an open question and we haven't really changed anything. Uh, there's also no, another alternative is, uh, is that uh, instead of saying how much memory we need, what we can say is how much disk space we want to cover with the cache. Then of course, you wouldn't know how much memory you're actually going to use, so you have the problem from the other side. But the, there's still an ongoing discussion. Uh, there's a bug in the Red Hat bug seal about this, but nothing has been conclu uh, concluded yet. There's a few patches, but the, this thing needs to be retaken. There's, however, a general uh, pattern that if we increase the cluster size, we decrease the metadata size. So one, one easy way of redu uh, reducing the amount of cache that we need is by in, uh, increasing the cluster size. That has the benefit that we have the same performance with a smaller cache, has also the benefit that, that it reduces fragmentation in the QCO2 image, but it has two problems. Allocations are slower because every time you allocate a cluster, you have to allocate a larger cluster, and it wastes more disk space, of course. There's also another problem, and is that uh, the QCO2 cache is not, there's not just one cache for the whole VM. Uh, the cache is attached to each one of the QCO2 images, so you have many images, each one of them needs its own cache. So in this example, we have a backing image with some uh, areas that have been allocated at the areas in blue, and the active image is empty. So every time the guest tries to read data, uh, QM goes to the backing image because the active image doesn't have anything. So that means that QM needs to load the metadata for uh, uh, mapping the clusters in the backing image. Now what happens? If you start to write data, the QM is going to write into the active image. And what happens after a while is that all the sections that are now in green are sections that the guest cannot see anymore because the data for those clusters is now in the active file. Uh, <clears throat> that has the consequence that all the metadata that we read earlier in order to uh, read those clusters in the backing file is now useless. It's now in memory and you, we don't need it anymore. If we have a longer backing chain, then this problem can, uh, can be bigger, of course. There's a way to work around this, and this was introduced a couple of years ago, and it's a setting called cache clearing interval. And the way this works is that you define a timeout, and then QM uh, checks the cache every 50, 60 seconds or whatever you decide, and removes the entries that haven't been used uh, since then. This way, the, all the entries that were necessary to, to address the areas in green would disappear and the memory would be safe. There's another problem uh, that is a consequence of increasing the, the cluster size. When you, we increase the cluster size, we increase the L2 table size because it's the same. And uh, since the QCO2 cache always reads complete tables, this means that if we need to get a L2 metadata, QM needs to load the, ho uh, the whole table. And if we need to update one table, then QM needs to write the whole table. Uh, that means more I.O. It's also um, a more inflexible and inefficient use of the cache memory. And we will see it with this example. Here we have a 512 gigabyte uh, hard drive um, and the cluster size is uh, one megabyte. So with this setup we need only uh, four L2 tables. And the way the addressing works is that each one of the L2 tables contains entries to map the clusters on uh, each one of these four uh, chunks of 128 gigabytes. So if you need to perform I.O. in the first chunk, so no matter how, uh, as long as you are performing I.O. in the, before zero and the first 128 gigabytes, all the metadata that you need is located in the first table. 
So with the first table, you're fine. You load the first table in memory, and you're fine. However, if you're, where the region where you're performing the I.O. overlaps two of these big chunks, you actually need metadata from the two tables. So that means that you need to keep two megabytes of uh, metadata in memory, even though in practice you are only using a few entries from each one of those tables. This can be solved uh, easily by reducing the cache granularity. So the cache in QEMU, as I said, reads and writes complete L2 tables. But there's no need to do that. Uh, instead of reading complete tables, we can make the cache read uh, slices. So it will be like smaller portions of the tables that would only contain, uh, contain less information and that would be enough for our needs. This involves, uh, this means that we would have less disk I.O. Also the size of the slice can be adjusted so it, it would match the, the host file system. The benefit of this is that the on disk format of QCO2 doesn't need to change. The QCO2 format itself doesn't know about slices. This is a purely uh, internal parameter of the QCO2 driver. The driver itself, of course, needs changes, but it's relatively, it, it needs relatively few changes. And there's already patches available in the mailing list. I sent them a couple of weeks ago and are available for, re for review. This is a quick example that I, uh, test that I made with 4K random reads with an SSD backend. And as you can see, the performance uh, is clearly better with 4K classes, especially uh, with larger clusters. So now that we've seen the problems that are consequence of the L2 and L2, the L1 and L2 tables, let's see the problems that are uh, consequence of the way the clusters are allocated in QM. So clusters are the smaller units of allocation. So you, when you allocate a new cluster, you have to fill it with data. So if the, for example, if you're right in, a, uh, in that red region over there, you had to fill the uh, rest of the cluster with the data that was there before. It, there was no data, uh, you had to go either to the backing file or fill it uh, with zeros if there was no backing file. So in this case, what the basic algorithm and what QM was doing is it first writes into the, the red region, then it reads the region immediately before from the backing file, then it writes that, then it reads the region afterwards, and then it writes it. That's a total of five operations. And as you can imagine, that's not a very optimal way of doing it. Um, however, luckily this was fixed recently, and now since QEMU 2.10, uh, we are only doing two operations. We are reading the whole cluster from the backing image, and we are writing it with the modified data into the new image. This, the results of this depend a lot on the scenario, depends a lot on the cluster size and on the type of uh, backend. But some averages that I produce with my test it's 60% faster in the case of uh, rotating disks and 15% faster in the case of SSDs. Another way to make allocation faster is that uh, not to allocate whole clusters at the same time. We could divide a cluster into subclusters, and each time we do allocation, we only allocate one of the subclusters. In order to do that, we would need to update the uh, L2 table entries, so they would store a bitmap that would indicate which one of the subclusters uh, are allocated. This would reduce the allocation uh, overhead while keeping some of the benefits of having large clusters. The status of this is that this was proposed in April. Uh, had, there was a long discussion in the mailing lists. My prototype shows two to four times more I.O. operations per second during allocations. If you actually um, adjust the subcluster size so it's equal to the request size, for example, the, uh, you can adjust it to the whole file system uh, block. Then there's no copy and write at all, and the results are much faster. Other benefits is that you could actually create pre-allocated QCA2 images with backing files, which is currently not possible. But there are several problems with this approach. One of them is the, the most clear one is that it's incompatible. Uh, you need incompatible format changes. So any images created with subcluster cannot be read with uh, older versions of QMU. It also increases the, comp the complexity of the QCO2 driver um, more significantly than the previous changes that I was discussing. And it also increases the data fragmentation in the image since we are allocating smaller portions now. One other way to uh, improve allocation is this one. So when we're writing to a newly allocated cluster, we must fill it with the old data, as I said before. If there was no old data, then what QMU does is pad the request with zeros and writes everything. So in other words, it writes zeros into the disk. Uh, 
So instead of writing those zeros, we could use uh, pre-allocate the cluster using f-allocate, and then only write the actual data that the guest was sending. This needs support from the OS and the file system. It should work in XT4 and XFS, and there's already patches in the mailing list. In this case, the work, I was not involved in this work, but I plan to review it and help bringing it forward. So um, as a last thing, I would like to mention uh, one other problem that I detected this year. And although it's not a big problem in general, if your storage backend is fast, uh, it can be noticeable. So when QMU works, uh, writes data in the disk, there's sanity check to prevent corruption. So before writing data to a data cluster, it first verifies that the actual place that we are writing doesn't uh, overlap with existing uh, metadata clusters. These checks have been there for a while, and since QMU 1.7, and they are normally fast and you don't need to worry about them, but some of them are relatively expensive. So I'm not going to describe all of them because it doesn't, uh, I don't think it makes sense for this talk now, but there's three types of, of tests. The first type is the uh, test that's running constant time. Those are very fast and you don't need to worry about them. The second type is the, the test that don't run in constant time, but all the data that they need are in memory. So they are usually also very fast. And the third time actually needs to, the, the third kind needs to go to the disk in order to, to perform the check. Uh, this third type of checks, there's only one in this, uh, in this category, is disabled by default because it's very slow. As for the others, there's one in particular that is a refcon block that is particularly expensive because it needs to go over the whole refcon uh, table and check if all the entries and see if our request is over, uh, overwriting any of those entries. This uh, test, the effect of this, can, uh, the negative impact of this test can be measured if your storage backend is fast. In my laptop, I can measure it very easily if I store the QCO2 image in RAM. So uh, in QM2.9, fortunately, uh, we found a way to optimize it. So now it should be, it should be working fine and should be um, not noticeable, at least in most cases. But you might want to take a look anyway at those checks and uh, uh, disable it in your case and then see if they have an impact. So that was basically uh, all that I wanted to talk about. I will now be, uh, give a very brief summary on ev of everything. So for the QCO2 L2 cache, the cache is, has been working there for a while. And there's the parameters to configure it already. It maybe needs default, uh, better defaults or configuration options, but that's up to discussions and we don't have a conclusion of that, on that yet. As for L2 slices, the patches on the mailing list, uh, I, there will be hopefully re be reviewed soon. So if everything goes fine, we should, be, we should have them uh, soon in QMU. About performing uh, copy and write with two operations instead of five, this has been already uh, included recently, so it's available in QM 2.10. About the Q copy and write with pre-allocation instead of writing zeros, there's patches in the mailing list, they still need to be reviewed. Subcluster allocation is still in RFC status. I would like to actually to uh, review this after all the rest of the things uh, are merged to see if it still makes sense and um, and decide what to do about it. And then the metadata overlap checks, as I said, since QMO 2.9, I think all of them should be fine, but you might want to check them uh, manually in case uh, it, they apply to your, uh, to your case. And uh, I think that's all from my side. I would like to take the opportunity to thank Outscale for funding my work and sponsoring this. And if you have any questions, With the subcluster allocation, you said the problem, well, the, one of the big drawbacks was you needed to change the on-disk format, but it's not obvious to me why the, why the units you pull into your cache have to be tied to the on-disk cluster size. Couldn't you pull in sub-pieces of the L2 tables into your cache without changing the on-disk format? Oh, sorry, I didn't get the, <laughs> the whole question. Can you please repeat? The subcluster allocation, the problem you seems to be addressing is that the granularity of your caching is very large. It's an entire cluster. But I don't see why the granularity of that caching has to be tied to the on-disk cluster size. Why yeah. can't that be smaller? Yeah, there's another, there's, as I mentioned, there was one of the proposals was to uh, 
change the granularity of the cache and use the slices instead of full tables. Right, but I don't see why that affects the on-disk format. It has to affect the on-disk format. No, this format. doesn't affect the on-disk format. The subcluster allocation, the way it works is that in order to know which one of the subclusters has been allocated, you need a bitmap somewhere to store that information. So that you need to store on disk. Oh, I see. It's just the allocation. Right. Okay. Uh, so you said that uh, there's the cache cleaning interval. Is that operation expensive? Can you just pick any number and... You can pick any number. Basically, it just sets a timer for the time that you say it, and then it uh, goes over the cache. It should be very quick because everything's in memory, and it just uh, uh, frees that memory. Okay, so, so it, it, it does not really need to be configured precisely by the users? No. There okay. could be... A, I mean, maybe the... There wasn't really a discussion of, uh, it's disabled by default, there has never been a discussion. I guess one argument against making it a default is that it would perhaps make the amount of memory that the QMU uses a bit more volatile because yeah. it goes up and down, so perhaps the user doesn't want that. But other than that, there's, it shouldn't be an expensive operation. Okay, thanks. No more questions? Well, then I guess we're done. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.